Today, we're going to look at a story that doesn't just impact the University of Illinois, but the entire policies of the state of Illinois. I will be talking to Brady Burden, a member of the organizing committee of the Illinois Legislative Staff Association, who have been working to unionize the employees of the Illinois House Speaker's office. We're going to talk about why this issue matters so much. We can ensure that the people of Illinois are properly served. As it stands right now, we're not given the resources to do that. We're going to go over the political context that Illinois finds itself in. And I'm going to say this, but I don't mean it in a derogatory type of way. Illinois is a one-party state. This story will take us through some interesting ways that one of the leaders of the Democratic Party of Illinois that has made strides in support of labor unions is appearing to contradict these principles. To do this, we're going to talk about some of the legal background of the situation. They explicitly exclude us from the definition of person, they exclude us from the definition of employee, and they exclude the General Assembly from the definition of employer. And we're going to talk about some of the finer details of this case that haven't always been reported on thoroughly. This is something that I have said multiple times in interviews, and it never quite makes it to print. With that being said, thank you so much for tuning in. Let's go ahead and dive into this. It therefore seems to me most important that you, the people of the state of Illinois, should know your university. Is it doing what you want it to do as the people's university? You are the owners, and your decision is final, 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 final. Learning and labor, labor, for the people and by the people. The people's university. Uh, I just wanted to give you a chance to introduce yourself, who you are, uh, what position you hold, and that kind of thing, or anything else you think might be relevant for this discussion. Yeah, sure thing. So I'm Brady Burden. Uh, I'm a member of the organizing committee of the Illinois uh, Legislative Staff Association, uh, and I work as an analyst for the Illinois House of Representatives, uh, specifically in the Speaker's office. I guess to give some like backstory a little bit for how you got here, I was curious how you got involved in Illinois' legislative politics and uh, more specifically, what area of policy you're working in. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, I had a bit of a non-traditional, I guess, entrance into this field in the sense that most of the people that they hire for these types of jobs are political science or masters of uh, policy and administration or whatever. Uh, on the other hand, me, however, I am a uh, like a math and environmental science major. I was I was actually working at a lab dissecting rats uh, before I took this job. Uh, I got the call for the job offer like on my lunch break while I was doing that. Um, and then like I said, when I started on staff, I was uh, kind of, I kind of just did uh, a little bit of everything. Something that we've been having an issue with is a uh, turnover in my place of work. So because of that new staff are kind of required to do a little bit of everything. But nowadays I mainly do environmental stuff like climate and uh, more broadly budgetary stuff for uh, the general services silo, which is just kind of a mishmash of everything that uh, is like meta government. So I guess like before we get into more of the details with the ILSA, uh, I was curious if you could maybe try to give us some context about the state of Illinois politics right now and just kind of describe the landscape that exists right now. And I guess another question I think it was interesting to this whole story is the current direction of the Democratic you know, government in Illinois and the public reception has definitely been that it's moving in a more progressive direction with the uh, legislation passed in the current Democratic legislature and Governor Pritzker. If you could give your perspective on all that. Uh, yeah, no, certainly. I think that um, and I'm going to say this, but I don't mean it in a derogatory type of way. Uh, Illinois is a one party state. And what I mean by that is anything that the Democrats want to do. Uh, they can do with or without any sort of support from the Republicans and without the support of a substantial amount of the Democrats even. We need, uh, what is it, 60 votes 
to pass stuff um and we have or to pass to pass things like as a super majority and uh we have what is it like 68 or something like that so well over what is needed uh let alone well over the 50 percent needed to pass legislation but you know, when people talk about uh, one party states, uh, they usually mean it in a derogatory type of way, like that's a negative and that's understandable. But it's important to note that when you have a party that is as big as the Illinois Democratic Party is, you have splits. So in a sense, the Democratic Party is actually multiple parties within itself, uh, at least in Illinois. So you have the moderates and the progressives, you have downstate and uh, like Chicago Metro, uh, you have the Black Caucus, the Latino Caucus, the w- the Women's Caucus, and all these different caucuses, uh, cockeye, cockodes, ha- each have their own different priorities. And we kind of saw this uh, towards the end of session last year when, or not last year, this year, when uh, we were trying to pass the revenue bill uh, that was needed in order for uh, the budget to be uh, balanced. Um, And the moderates pulled a bunch of people off to prove a point. Um, The moderates weren't intending on not having the revenue bill pass, but they wanted to show that if they wanted to, they could. Um, And they showed that very clearly for everyone to see it ended up uh, because of some mismanagement uh it ended up taking like two or three hours to get that revenue bill passed we had to vote on it i think three times that's a lot yeah it's it's a lot and it's actually more than you're supposed to we had to suspend the rules and that, that's the thing right is like if we if the democrats didn't have a uh what is it they're at like 60 they're, they're, i think they're at like 67 percent of the house of representatives right now and if they didn't have that they wouldn't have been able to suspend the rules like that you know you need you need uh 60 percent of people to suspend the rules which coincidentally is the number of people that you needed to pass the revenue package which goes to show that like it's not it, the intent was never uh by the moderate caucus to like not have that bill pass the point was to prove a point and that was it um, the only reason it failed uh, in the first place was actually because uh, the Republicans were getting sneaky and using some what would you call it, pr- procedural tricks to make sure that the Democrats were on their toes during this whole process. Uh, and more power to them for doing that. It's always fun to see. Yeah, though I, I definitely have seen the seen some of that myself in uh, any kind of. Robert's rules dominated environment it, uh, <laughs> is, 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 is frequently going to happen, you know, that people are going to do what they can to try to, you know, work around the rules. Okay, so within that context of like, you're talking about the different factions within, within the Democratic Party in Illinois, I guess, you know, there is this more moderate faction, there's this more progressive faction, there's maybe been some, there's been some legislation that might be uh, sponsored or promoted more by the progressive faction that has passed, even if there might be some objections to it because of this, you know, the super majority that is present in the legislature. And that makes sense. And I, and I, and I agree that the, the one party state, uh, you know, idea isn't necessarily have to be a negative one. If it's a true democratic representation of what people are, are voting for, which I think in Illinois, it's pretty clear that the majority of people are voting for Democrats. And that's not a, you know, a, a flawed representation of, of people's will, uh, especially when you kind of look at specific policy issues that are being passed that are overwhelmingly quite popular. Um, I guess that kind of transitions us into the next thing I want to ask you, which is what are to like kind of talk about some of the recent more specific policies that have changed in this different political climate. Uh, and, uh, you know, since the since Pritzker has uh, been governor and, and defeated the Republican uh, Rich Rauner, and I guess the two things I want to ask you about, which I think are probably uh, most relevant to you, are our first environmental policy, uh, which is what, uh, you know, your personal focus includes, but also uh, labor unions and workers' rights, because I think that's very much uh, relevant to this broader conversation about the Illinois Legislative Staff Association. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, th- I think uh, so for environmental policy. It's useful to note that Illinois is a bit of a weird edge case. When it comes to environmental policy, uh, being uh, originally a coal state, right, 
but still having like substantial democratic control. It led to some very counterintuitive bits of legislation. Us being in the uh, more enlightened era of twenty of the twenty twenties, we know clean coal isn't actually a thing. But if you look at uh, Illinois statute even now, but especially before the clean job the Clean Jobs Act. Uh, so what, what does C just stand for? Clean um, Energy and Jobs Act, I think. Um, got passed a couple of years ago, there were all these carve outs for coal, Illinois coal, clean coal. Um, one specific example is uh, in, in the uh, statute that handles the Illinois Power Agency, which is uh, the agency that kind of uh, handles like uh, electricity procurement for the entire state. They actually have the ability to create power plants, which is something that in Illinois we never do. Like the nowadays, the, the government always outsources things, we privatize and all that. But the Illinois Power Agency, if they so chose, could uh, build a like a wind farm, a solar farm, um, any kind of energy with the exception of a nuclear power plant. That's the only exception. Uh, and that's actually because of federal rules. Uh, but here's the kicker. In order to do that, they first have to build a clean coal power plant uh using illinois coal oh that's the first thing they have to build (laughs) well that's a a bit of a bummer Um. yeah it's um and i think the issue is that we we just missed that when we were writing when we when cj was being written uh but like it kind of goes to show like that's the type of stuff that uh you get when on one hand you have and like uh, nothing against like the, the coal uh, against coal country, uh, those are to an extent the people that built this country, but like its time has passed. And that's what happens when you have legislation that's written by people that want to pr- still protect those coal jobs, but also understand how coal is like a terrible thing for uh, the environment, the economy, and even the people and communities uh, that are focused around it, right? And you can see a similar thing in CJA when th- there's a, there's an exemption. We're supposed to get rid of all coal power plants by, uh, I want to say it's, it's 2030 or 2035. Uh, but there are two exceptions, and, and they're under one loophole, and that's municipally owned coal power plants. And those two specific coal power plants, uh, one is in Springfield. Uh, it's the Dahlman uh, power plants. They're owned by CWLP. Uh, which is the municipal like uh, municipal uh, electricity company in Springfield, and the other is the uh, Prairie State campus, which is just like a bunch of it's it's the I think it's like the biggest CO two emitter. It's definitely the biggest in Illinois. I think it might be like top five in the country. Uh, it's this huge coal power plant that was built in the early two thousands through uh, basically like a bunch of municipalities primarily in the Chicago metro area got together to fund a coal power plant being built uh, in southern Illinois to like, provide power for them. And both Dalman and Perry State represent this huge like stranded asset for the municipalities that uh, like invested in it. Uh, in the early 2000s. Now, obviously, you can and I would make the argument that that was a really stupid investment to make during the early 2000s when, like, we all knew, like, this, this isn't like we're not talking about the 50s. Everybody knew climate change was the thing. Everybody knew that at some point in the next 20 years or so. Uh, we would stop kicking the can down the road. Um, and the life the life uh, lifespan of a coal power plant, that type of infrastructure, we're talking about the order of like 50 years to 100 years. So anybody that's investing that level of capital into something that might only see a quarter of its expected lifespan, that's a mistake, right? So like in terms of, so that that's like just background for like what environmental protection in Illinois kind of looks like. But in terms of like the good things that we've done, right? Obviously, CJA is huge. It's been huge for equity. It's been huge for making that transition to things that aren't coal and natural gas. Uh, I think I read recently that Illinois is the fifth most friendly state for solar power uh, in the country, which is impressive, especially considering we're not an especially sunny place 
we're not far enough south to where we're getting extra sun. Like, because during the winter, we don't get all that much. And we're a lot cloudier than, say, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, and like Southern California. So a lot of what we do a really good job at is leveraging the fact that Illinois is still, despite what people say, like kind of an industrial uh, powerhouse. Like, yes, we've uh, definitely deindustrialized a lot, but so has everywhere in the United States. But Illinois is still uh, the center of all rail infrastructure in the United States. It's the center of all uh, natural gas pipelines in the United States and storage. Um, we... That's why natural gas is so cheap here. It's because like the the entire country's like natural gas flows through Illinois, uh, gets stored primarily. I mean, it gets stored everywhere, but like we have huge reservoirs in Illinois that it gets stored in, um, which is why basically everywhere in southern Illinois has cheap natural gas. Uh, the same thing with like electric, like electricity, right? Like we have, uh, MISO and PJM, two huge, uh, interchanges that, uh, are both in this state. PJM in like the Chicago land and MISO for like Southern Illinois. We have all these nuclear power plants, uh, aging, yes, but like we're like, we're one of the only states that has like that level of nuclear power. So, uh, what we are able to do is we can leverage all these resources and our unique, uh, like our unique situation, um, in a way that a lot of states uh, that are like environmentally friendly but not necessarily as well situated, like Maine or like Wisconsin or, or actually not Wisconsin, like uh, Minnesota, might not be able to. Right, but on the flip side are the way we kind of handle, and this isn't like an Illinois specific thing. This is the case in most states in the union. Uh, we're reactive rather than proactive when it comes to environmental protection. Uh, a perfect example of this is uh, when the Supreme Court basically neutered the, uh, the Clean Water Act uh, last year. It basically got rid of at the at the federal level, basically all protections for wet, wetlands. Um, and in Illinois, especially, we didn't have any sort of framework for protecting wetlands outside of uh, what we were required to do under the Clean Water Act. So when the Supreme Court struck that down, we were caught on the back foot, basically. Uh, and we still don't have an actual like fix for that. But the thing is, is we shouldn't have been caught on the back foot. This is something that was like uh, Waters of the United States is something that industry has been trying to take a swing at for the past 40 years. Like this is not like new information. Uh, Illinois used to have wetlands everywhere. And now we have like basically no wetlands. So I guess what I'm saying is, yes, Illinois is very environmentally friendly, but only in a way like we only address problems as they come up rather than seeing a problem and then trying to prevent it which is i know a little bit less positive than you were probably expecting <laughs> but no i mean i think that that tracks i guess a little bit i mean I, i'm from southern illinois so i i'm from carbondale actually which you know in the name you kind of uh, hear the hear the fossil fuel uh yeah, coal country. history uh so i have definitely some idea i mean i i wasn't like, you know, exposed all the time to the kind of conversations around this, because I don't think Carbondale really has many coal mining jobs anymore. Um, but nobody uh, does. Yeah. So but I, I, I mean, I guess that, that that does make some sense to me. I, I mean, I've heard, you know, good stories about certain, you know, uh, protections being made here. But I know, I guess, with how bad the climate crisis is, I my my general baseline assumption is that nowhere is doing anywhere near enough. So and that way, uh, what you said has met my expectation, but there was a lot of details that I was not familiar with. So that was really interesting to hear more about. And I think um, makes some sense as well with with what you described as the political dy dynamic and and how, uh, you know, uh, people want to protect certain uh, economic or uh, other interests in their constituency or coming from a certain political perspective. So. I guess with that being said, we can maybe switch over to talking a little bit about labor unions and workers' rights. The most obvious, I guess, thing that, that comes to mind for me is the Workers' Rights Amendment, which I actually have a sign 
floor behind me. But uh, other than that, I guess I'm curious uh, if there's anything else you think uh, is worth talking about. And one in terms of the context of the the state government and uh, what the public policy changes have been around uh, labor unions and workers' rights. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that if, the, if there's one thing that can be said for uh, the Illinois Democratic Party and to an extent J.B. Pritzker is that they're very good on workers' rights as a whole. Not in every case. Uh, there are like there are some like niche areas where uh, they are they don't uh, might not necessarily have been protecting workers' rights and as much as the unions and uh, activists might have hoped. But on the whole, uh, if there if I if I am the uh, typical Illinois worker, uh, I do I would trust like the Illinois Democratic Party to uh, look out for my interests as a worker. Um, they do a fantastic job of making sure. So like unions historically, right, have been traditionally more white and more male, uh, especially in like the trades. Um, and as of the past like 10 years or so, 15 years, uh, as a state, we've done a fantastic job of really trying to make sure that if you are a person of color, if you are a woman or non-binary person and you want to work in the trades, you can do that. And if you are a small business owner who uh, it, it, like fits those demographics and you're trying to uh, like get a contract in, for something like that, like you, you have that opportunity in a way that you just hadn't before. Like, I mean, I guess the, the thing is, Primarily, with the exception of creating tier two uh, as a thing for state employees, I think that is the one black mark um, in uh, like Illinois labor history in recent memory. Everything else has been like pretty good. The workers' rights amendment, as most people view it, is kind of just like a doorstop to like prevent any backsliding on all of the things that labor has won for uh, like the workers of Illinois. You know? Yeah, it's very symbolic, I think. But I mean, it also w- would serve as a legitimate protection if there was any kind of erosion of federal rights and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. The kind of stuff that we should be doing with uh, environmental protections, the kind of stuff we should have done with Roe v. Wade. Right, exactly. That makes sense. Uh, I guess, I, I don't know if you've looked at data, I haven't. So maybe you're, there's uh, accuracy to the kind of white and male... I, I think that's definitely the image a lot of people have of labor unions. But I do want to say that I think I do think there's a lot of unions that are uh, whether it be service workers, nurses or other like sectors that are unionized that are very much uh, not dominated by that demographic, even if that is the uh, like image often associated with labor unions. And uh, and unfortunately, I, I think. Oh, no. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, yeah. I, w- what I had meant is that like that's historically that's kind of been how people looked at unions. Yes, right. Yeah. And there there are like individual unions that definitely weren't the case when you look at like even Illinois specific unions. Uh, the uh, oh, this is this is a rail union. I'm trying to remember are you, are you, uh, in the the Pullman one of the, the Pullman, yeah, Pullman unions. Yeah, yeah well, the, like the, yeah, the, the, the a lot of the unions in that strike were yeah. um, like non-white or were like integrated. Yeah, um, I, I'm forgetting the exact details, too, because the uh, Pullman strike led by Debs, a lot of those workers were coming from what we would now consider white, uh, but then maybe not immigrant communities. But there was also the there were also other workers uh, for the Pullman company that unionized later on the the porters, yeah, the porters. That's the one which I was, was thinking basically of. almost entirely black union. And, and unsurprisingly, uh, they faced more repression and took longer for them to form a union and get get kind of the, the rights that they deserved. But yeah, there's a long history of, of labor organizing in, in many different groups in Illinois, for sure. I guess I wanted to kind of bring that around to the Illinois Legislative Staff Association and specifically the Speaker of the Illinois House, uh, Speaker Welch, and kind of just ask about how uh, he would fit into this whole story about the state government. And then maybe if you could explain a little bit what I'll essay has been uh, up to recently. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're going to have to do a tiny bit of a history lesson first, but uh, this shouldn't take good. too long. Uh, so in the mid to later part of the 20th century, there was a push to formalize 
unions of public sector employees. This is something that had been done as kind of like one-offs throughout the uh, throughout the 20th century, and I think a little bit in the 19th century, the late part of it, like the uh, Postal Service being an example. But what we ended up doing, and this is something that basically happened in every state after the uh, NLRA in its current form was kind of uh, formalized, uh, this would have been around the, uh, uh, the JFK administration, is states started uh, creating their own labor protections for uh, basically public employees because most private sector employees were covered by the NLRA. Uh, some exceptions being farm workers, uh, domestic workers, and there's another category that I'm blanking on, but like that, that type of work. So the states, they really could only go, they could really only regulate those excluded employees and then public employees. So in Illinois, we have two primary labor labor uh, relations frameworks. Uh, the first one being the Illinois Labor Relations Board through the Illinois Public Labor Relations Act, and the other being the Illinois Education Relations Board, uh, which primarily handles uh, education, you know, teachers. But the uh, ILRB handles basically everything else. And it was a pretty, uh, like, all-encompassing organization, uh, or I should say agency at the time. But during the, uh, the 80s or 90s, there was a union drive in the uh, legislative printing unit of the Illinois General Assembly. Word got up to the uh, four uh, caucus leaders, one of which at the time was Michael Madigan. And within the day, they had a bill that made it through both houses and got onto the governor's desk that excluded employees of the General Assembly from any of the labor protections that were under the Illinois Public Labor Relations Act. So what that means is for employees of the General Assembly, we had been reset to a pre-NLRA, pre-IPLRA paradigm uh, when it comes to labor relations. But notably, it does not ban anybody from unionizing. I think it, like how it works is, like, it, is they explicitly exclude us from the definition of person. Uh, they exclude us from the definition of employee. And they exclude the General Assembly from the definition of employer. Uh, so not a ban, just an exclusion from the, uh, the rights, remedies, and procedures that are established in that, that bit of legislation. So moving back to closer to modern day, 2022, the people of Illinois vote to approve the, uh, the, the uh, Workers' Rights Amendment, a little bit misnamed because it's actually more accurately, I would call it the Employee Rights uh, Amendment since uh, it doesn't include contractors uh, and other people that might not uh, fit the definition of employee, right? But uh, approved overwhelmingly because that's how we have to do it uh, in order for it to be a constitutional amendment. You need uh, it, it, it's you basically need a super majority of people yeah. to vote for it. Isn't it like sixty percent? I can I can. There's check. yeah. There, there's two. There's two. Um, like it's either you need fifty percent of all more than fifty percent of all people voting, or sixty percent of people who voted on that specific question because a lot of that's people right. don't vote on everything right? right yeah it's a little bit of a weird criteria but yeah that yeah makes sense. and i think it i think it 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 almost got both but it definitely got one of those i don't remember which it was anyway so that passed uh the people voted november 5th of 2022 and every employee in illinois has the right to form a union there's a uh, Actually, let me for for the benefit of uh, the listener, let me real quick pull up Illinois General Assembly website and then read the specific text. Article one, uh, Bill of Rights, Section 25, Workers' Rights. Employees shall have the fundamental right to organize and to bargain collectively through representatives of their own choosing for the purpose of negotiating wages, hours, and working conditions, and to protect their economic welfare and safety at work, period. 
No law shall be passed that interferes with, negates, or diminishes the right of employees to organize, bargain collectively over their wages, hours, other terms, conditions of employment, and workplace safety, including law ordinance prohibiting the execution and application of agreements between employers and labor organizations that represent employees requiring membership in an organization as a condition of employment. And it's uh, controlling over Section 6 of Article uh, 7, which isn't really relevant to like the discussion that we're about to have. But you'll note that that is there are two sections there, two sentences. The first one shall have the fundamental right uh, and then period. And then it talks about laws being passed. A a child's reading and um, a competent lawyer's reading of that amendment says that it gives a positive right to unionize, which basically means that if a group of employees want to unionize, they should be allowed to do so. And like preventing them from doing that is just like you, you can't, right? Like you, you have to work with them to allow it to happen if they show that they can, uh, versus the negative rights version, which is basically just, uh, they're allowed to do it, um, legally, uh, and you can't ban it. So. After uh, the people of Illinois voted overwhelmingly to support this amendment and have it added to the Constitution, the Illinois Legislative Staff Association on November 29th went and signed cards uh, for a majority of uh, staff in our proposed bargaining unit in the office of the Speaker. That, uh, that card signing took less than 30 minutes. Uh, and we got, uh, oh, what was it, around 30 signed cards. Uh, we went to we went and got the cards off site, went to the speaker's office, uh, requested a meeting with the speaker, and requested voluntary recognition uh, for the union. To make a long story short, uh, we have yet to meet with the speaker one-on-one to discuss this. Um, and they are refusing to recognize our right to form a union and collectively bargain for the benefit of, um, our coworkers. So is the refusal based on this, uh, previous legislation that exempts, uh, general assembly workers from the definition of employee? Is that a justification offered? Is there been a justification clearly offered or is it just been this kind of refusal? So it is their justification has primarily been that that exemption, um, but it's a bad faith objection because, like, as I kind of established earlier, you don't like it's it's not a ban. It's just exempting from a specific like administrative process for this to like go through. And uh, you'll find if you listen to. Uh, We actually had people testify on this. In fact, the people that the speaker had testify on this even said that was the case. They didn't recommend it, but they did say that even without that like framework, we could still like form a union. It would just take the courts to kind of like enforce things that normally would be taken care of by the Illinois Labor Relations Board, uh, which is expensive. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I it, it seems clear that there is a right to form a union, but there isn't the same legal protections to do so. And that's kind of what the speaker is relying on uh, right now. As... So I, I would make a distinction there. So the legal protections are all there. It's just in order to enforce it, we have to go through the courts right. uh, okay. rather than just appealing to the Illinois Labor Relations Board, because like appealing to the ILRB is like it's like a it's like a filing i don't even think that they have a fee like you just file a like an unfair labor practice complaint you uh file a request to uh have an election that type of stuff and that's all free at the point of pro- point of purchase it happens relatively quickly and it's like it's like it's established it's an established process uh whereas going through the courts we filed for a lawsuit in uh at the end of may of this year we are probably not going to have like actual oral arguments on this case uh until november or december uh which is you know that's six months right yeah so not only does the forcing you know this process to go through the courts take a lot longer i would i would maybe i mean i don't know how long exactly the normal 
uh, Illinois Labor Relations Board should take, but I imagine it wouldn't be quite this long, but also it's going to be more expensive as you have legal fees and everything to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the speaker is kind of relying on that, frankly. Um, the, I mean, I had mentioned that this whole, this whole thing started in November of 2022. Uh, it's currently August of 2024. That is almost two years, almost a full general assembly where we have basically been given the runaround and like gaslit, gatekeeped. Uh, we've yet to be girl bossed, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, we're waiting, right? <laughs> Whereas ILRB, uh, throughout this whole rigmarole and process in an attempt to not be confrontational, to not go uh, and make this a big deal publicly, in an attempt to not have this be a lawsuit, at the questionable advisement of the Speaker's counsel at the time, who, by the way, got fired for uh, giving unconstitutional legal advice for a different reason. That's always a good sign. Yeah, no, that's always a great sign. So, uh, but it's okay because he's now uh, lobbying for uh, the uh, gambling industry. Oh, so okay. it's all well, good. But what, what what basically we were advised, uh, and this is a direct quote, you should go through the established process. So here's here's my question, Nico. What do you think the established process is? Uh, for a group of employees who have been excluded from the ex- established process uh, by statute. Yeah, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Yeah, no, that's bad faith. That's it, At best, it's bad faith. Wait, so this is what the Illinois Labor Relations Board told, said? No, this is what the speaker's chief oh, counsel okay. said. Okay. Because we, we asked, we were, they said, okay, we can't recognize you because of the law. We said, okay, that's horseshit, but how would you like us to... Pr- like, to Proceed. Like, what what, what can right. we do to, like, see some sort of movement on this? The speaker has been a champion of labor his entire career. How can we work with him to make this uh, work for everybody, make it so that way nobody gets embarrassed, make it so that way nobody has to stick their neck out? Nobody has to go on podcasts to complain about <laughs> um, this process. And they basically said, well, we're not going to do anything. If you want to do something, go through the established process. And then and our lawyer, one, one of our lawyers was on the call at this time, and he was just in, as confused as we were. And the question was, well, what established process? And the response was, well, I'm not your lawyer. I can't tell you that. So we said, OK, the established process can mean one of two things. It can either mean you want us to sue you or you want us to go through the Illinois Labor Relations Board. I'm go- We're going to assume unless you say otherwise, that you would prefer us to go through the Illinois Labor Relations Board. So we did. We filed with the ILRB. Uh, We did that January 5th of 2023. And we got a response in, uh, I think it was about three months. And that response basically said, yeah, no, we don't have the authority to like interpret the constitution like that. We can only interpret our statute. And our statute says uh, you are not part of our jurisdiction. Uh, We would encourage you to, uh, if if you want to go through ILRB, the courts will need to handle this. So we we followed up with the speaker's office and they were, they basically didn't have anything useful to say. So we went public in uh, May of 2023 and throughout the summer, no progress. And and then uh, out of left field, the speaker files a bill, poorly written bill. Uh, might I say it was uh, like uh, it, to, to me anyway, it was clear that that bill had been written uh, over the course of about a week. And I say that because of all of the uh, drafting errors that were in it and the fact that most of it was copied and pasted from the uh, Illinois Public Labor Relations Act without like making updates to it that you would otherwise. They uh, they passed the bill. Uh, we had issues with it, and we communicated those issues to the speaker uh, well ahead of time. They passed the bill. They made some changes, but nothing substantial. Sent it over to the Senate, and it has sat there without uh, really uh, anything happening to it ever since. The speaker has not expressed interest in working on the bill. He hasn't expressed interest in getting the bill to pass the Senate. He's essentially washed his hands of the issue, as he has said publicly many times i passed the bill like what else do you want 
because apparently, according to him, his responsibility ends when uh, the bill leaves his chamber. So just to clarify, this bill would could even though I mean, you have certain uh, criticisms of like the, the language, would it serve to clarify if it were passed some of these disputes? Yes and no. Right. Ostensibly, yes, the bill would create a framework that would allow us to uh, go through the Illinois Labor Relations Board to resolve these disputes. But there are several fatal flaws in the legislation that basically make it unworkable. One of those being, so the way uh, the General Assembly is structured is each caucus has its own staff. And then there is nonpartisan staff for each chamber. So House Dem, House Republican, uh, House Clerk, the nonpartisan. Senate Dem, Senate Republican, Senate Operations Commission. What the bill does is it, it prescribes a bargaining unit. And the bargaining unit that it prescribes is that every House Dem staffer Every House Republican staffer, every Senate Dem staffer, every Senate Republican staffer have to be in the same bargaining unit. That is, to put it mildly, unworkable for for a lot of reasons. Primarily, forcing a bargaining unit when you have four separate employers is insane. Like, that's just, that's not something that's done. And... That's just from our perspective, right? But from like the speaker or the Senate president's perspective, it's also unworkable because what you're essentially saying is if Tony McCombie, the uh, minority leader, House GOP, she's the person that all the House GOP people work for, um, if she decides she's going to hire 100 new staffers, she can essentially like t- take over by the numbers, the bargaining unit, and then sabotage contract negotiations. Yeah, that that seems like it it doesn't really make sense. And it's also explicitly your employer setting what the bargaining unit is rather than the workers coming to an understanding of what the bargaining unit is as well, which, you know, in this case, through legislation, uh, rather than like the classification of employees that they are using or something. But that's like, that doesn't seem like it would create a lot of problems in this situation. Yeah. And from both management side and the workers side, I mean, this is it's just not good legislation, which is why, like, we haven't really pushed to have the bill moved because until the speaker, uh, well, I should say, first of all, we don't need a bill. Right. But until the speaker decides to uh, like actually come to the table and have like a serious discussion about what this framework is going to look like, there's really no point. Harmon has Senate President Harmon hasn't moved the bill. Uh, I wouldn't either if I were him, just even just in a vacuum, like just out of uh, like best practices, good government. Like it's just not a good bill. Also, like the the several rationales used by the speaker seem to not make a whole lot of sense to me. I'm not an you know expert over labor law or Illinois political dynamics, but generally speaking, if you are the speaker of a legislative chamber, the claim that you have absolutely no power over the other legislative chamber doesn't really make sense. Like you regularly are going to be working with and influencing the policies of the other chamber. Otherwise, you'd never be able to pass any legislation whatsoever. So obviously, the speaker does have some sort of influence, even if it's not, you know, the same kind of influence you have, of course, over your own chamber, over the Senate, and could theoretically push to have this bill passed, even if like you said, there would be reasons maybe not to not to want that to happen because of the issues with it. That is a seems like a poor excuse to me. And then on the other hand, also, I, I'm, you know, like I said, I'm not an expert in labor law, but it seems to me like if you recognize a group of employees right to form a union in the particular case, you would also have a right to voluntarily recognize them if you would if you wanted to. And so to claim that we don't have a that to use the, uh, ra- you know, the rationale that we can't voluntarily recognize you because it breaks labor law or breaks Illinois, like that doesn't make any sense either. If you believe there is some sort of proper means they could go to, 
I mean, you can say any employee, any employer does have the right to say, I do not voluntarily recognize you and you have to have an ele a union election or something like that. That's legally speaking their right. But it doesn't make sense to point to some other reason not to voluntarily recognize other than just a personal preference, because it seems to me like it really just is an articulation of a preference to not have uh, staff unionized rather than a legitimate good faith reading of the legal situation. And I got to say, I'm so happy that I came on here because this is something that I have said multiple times in interviews and it never quite makes it to print. So having having somebody who like actually kind of gets the not the, the minutia of like how and why labor law is the way it is, um, is really nice because you're absolutely right. Like unions existed well before any of these uh, like statutory frameworks existed. Um, and it didn't come like the, the right to unionize didn't come from these legislative frameworks. Constitutionally, it came from like a, a freedom of freedom of association, right? And secondarily, wh what is a union, right? A union is essentially a like like a, it's almost like a corporation uh, in the sense that like every worker has a stake in the union, like everybody gets a vote, right? And if I am the speaker's office and I want to uh, make a contract with a staffing company to staff my my assembly with like temp workers, that's something that is clearly within his purview. Um, that is just objectively something that he has done in the past. Uh, like individual contracts with employees. Uh, I was contract for the first uh, year that I worked here, uh, not under Speaker Welch, to be clear, but like that was me. Uh, that was like most of the lawyers that we had on staff. They were on a contractual basis. What is the difference between contracting with like a, a uh, an LLC or an individual person and contracting with a union from like a, like a legal standpoint? And the answer is there isn't uh, unless the law makes it different. And we're excluded from the law that would make it different, right? And as you bring up, like when you're talking about voluntary recognition, that is because we don't have like an administrative framework, unless we're going through the courts, any recognition is voluntary recognition. It would be like if we had an election, it would be voluntary recognition after an election. If he just recognized us like off the bat, card check. Uh, it would be voluntary recognition. Uh, if we struck, it would be voluntary recognition because what it boils down to is it's within the speaker's purview to do this. He runs the House of Representatives. If he wants to contract with people, he can do that. I mean, yeah, like it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right that there's no, like I, it doesn't make sense to, to, to cite some sort of legal restriction. I mean, it seems to basically be hiding behind the fact that there is a big difference between contract with the labor union and a individual contractor, not from a legal perspective, but from a political perspective or from a power analysis of the situation where workers do have more of a say, a more leverage over a contract when they're collectively bargaining, which is why that, that's the whole point of a, having a labor union in the first place and, and why politicians, you know, who support labor unions argue in favor of them because it does give that authority to employees. So I think that seems to be to be the key difference, even if there's a inaccurately cited legal distinction here. Most certainly. And I I'm going to take the reins a little bit, if that's OK, Yeah. because uh, something that I definitely want to get into is why we uh, want, need and have the right for a union. And I would say, first, even if we had no issues at all. Even if Chris Welch was the best boss in the world, you know, he, he like tucked me in with a warm glass of milk every night. Um, <laughs> he we would still have the right to form a union and there's nothing anybody can say or do uh, that should be able to uh, interfere with that. Like bar none. That's the whole point of the workers' rights amendment. And even without the workers' rights amendment, we still had the ability to do that. Uh, we just didn't have any protections. The Workers' Rights Amendment enshrined that. But as for the why, like, obviously there's a why. Everybody has their own reason for signing a card. Everybody in the organizing committee has their own reason for being here. 
everybody has their own reason for working for the General Assembly, right? Right now, like today, me or any one of the people that are in the organizing committee right now could go and take a job, make and make double what we make here. It's not about the money. Nobody's asking for $100,000 salaries, no, except for uh, like some of the people in management. Nobody is asking for anything unreasonable, but I can't speak to what people will want in negotiations because I'm not a member of the uh, bargaining committee. We can't elect a bargaining committee until we can have a free and fair election. And the only way to do that is to get recognized. What I can talk about are the issues that we have as workers in the General Assembly currently and how that impacts you and everybody listening to this podcast. The Illinois General Assembly represents 13 million people. And every single day, we are failing them in one way or another. And the reason why is because of systematic disinvestment in the legislature. The legislature's purpose is to hold the power of the purse and to be a check on the executive and judicial branches. We are supposed to be oversight on that. Uh, and with the with the resources that are being put towards that purpose, we are failing that job. Turnover in the speaker's office is basically 50% per year. Do you know of any place that isn't like paying minimum wage that can maintain 50% turnover year over year and still function? That's yeah, no, that's really, really a uh, high turnover for something with the kind of importance of that. I mean, not I mean, I think there's plenty of jobs that are having that kind of like you mentioned, like, you know, low paying jobs that have a ton of turnover that uh, as well. And that can have poor implications for those workplaces. But to think that that's happening on the policy level of the whole state, like of the workers who are helping uh, implement the policy and, and, and or not implement, but, you know, uh, Draft. Uh, draft it. Yeah. Create it. Right exactly. Is uh is worrying, definitely. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's the thing. It's like so the these the expertise uh to run the legislature has to come from somewhere. It, it and it, so if it's not going to come from the legislative staff, which currently um I we at least in the house, we're maybe about uh I would say a year and a half from uh, having essentially no institutional knowledge left. The uh, the union drive has like kind of stemmied the tide a little bit uh, in the sense that we forced a $6,000 raise in base pay, but it's not like it can only do so much. Uh, so if it's not coming from legislative staff, is it going to come from the legislators? Well, uh, I, that would be nice. Um, and at some point it may. But right now we have like the most like the, the most inexperienced legislature that we've had in a while. And under a uh, like a seasoned leadership team like Michael Madigan had, that didn't matter because he just ran the sh he ran the show. It didn't matter who you had. Uh, but and, and this is like a positive for Speaker Welch. Uh, he's try he, he uh, very much is allowing people to like take initiative and take responsibility for these kind of things that goes a long way to building that kind of institutional knowledge. But there's just so many, there's so many newer people. And I think the big thing is the difference between a legislator that has been in office for a couple of years before COVID versus a legislator who's been in office after COVID like for a state budget, we haven't had like a normal state budget since Rauner, really. I mean, even before then, because like you had the Great Recession, but like the these people, and I say that in the nicest way possible. I love uh like I, I love my job. I love working with the legislators. They like they care so much about all this stuff. And they're all like most of them are very talented and smart, but they've never experienced, and this is also the case with staff now, they've never experienced like an actual budget. There is not a single person in House Research and Appropriations staff, like as an analyst, uh, who has had to do a budget pre-COVID. So 
we, we've always had the uh, we've always had the ARPA money for like as far as like our institutional knowledge goes. We've never had to deal with like the Rauner administration. We've never had to deal with uh, a governor's office that is actively opposing the legislature in that way. Like we're lucky that J.B. Pritzker is who he is and isn't uh, interested in rocking the state like Rauner was. So all of that to say, a huge part for me of why this uh, of why this union drive matters is so that way we can ensure that the people of Illinois are properly served by properly serving the Illinois House Democratic Caucus. As it stands right now, we're not given the resources to do that. We are understaffed, overworked, underpaid, and frankly, disrespected on a daily basis. And like people say respect is earned. Yeah, sure. But disrespect also needs to be earned. And like legitimately, there's some stuff that I cannot say because that would it would uh, like probably irreparably um, harm some uh, relationships that I have. Uh, Oh, actually, what I can say is this. When we started the union drive, I was asked by three separate people on three separate occasions who put me up to this. Are you serious? That's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy for legislature. I mean, I don't know if legislatures, but people politically involved, whoever may like be communicating to you about this, who are, you know, presumably aware of the purported, you know, benefits of a labor union to kind of ask, assume that there there isn't just a good faith desire for these kind of things in the workplace. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, I, I, I don't like what did you expect when you hire a bunch of people like a, a bunch of people who care about like very passionate people, people that would otherwise be activists? Uh, you hire them just out of college. And that's the other thing, right, is like the way that the legislature is run is primarily taking advantage of people who see this as like a, a, t- a ticket to a career helping people in public policy. And because of that, they tolerate these working conditions that if this was the private sector, that never would happen. Like I, you're, you're telling me that people would be working 100 hour weeks in order to make $40,000 a year and then get paid three to one comp t- or sorry, not get paid, get three to one comp time. So for every hour of overtime you work, you get one third of an hour. That's crazy. Yeah, that that is crazy. And uh, to clarify, the the forty thousand dollars that's what I was making when I started. Uh, it's uh, the uh, base pay is bumped up to. Uh, actually, no, I made thirty seven when I started. Base pay is bumped up to. I think it's like in the high forties now. But anyway, to to make a long story short, the reason why uh, this, the reason why I care, and the reason why everybody should care about having. Uh, a union representing uh, workers in the General Assembly is this is a good governance thing. When you have union workers working on something, the quality of work is better. You are you make sure things are properly staffed and uh, the workplace becomes more sustainable. Is there any one last thing you want to add before we go? Something you want to shout out? I know that there is a legal fund uh, that folks can donate to for the ILSA. It, it, um, but I just wanted to ask if there's anything you wanted to in particular suggest yeah. people do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and so th- this is a three-parter and I'll make it quick. Um, so the first thing is uh, reach out to your legislator. Because and I even if you're even if you're a listener not in Illinois, reach out to your legislator because we have the like there are legislative union drives happening all over the country. Uh, California, New York, Oregon, Washington, Massachusetts, uh, some other states I can't say because they're not public yet. But like reach out, ask uh, your legislator, hey, how is your staff doing? Are you treating your staff well? And yeah, as you as you were saying. Yeah, we have we have a legal fund, a legal defense fund. It is at Ilsa two one seven on Twitter, um, and it's I think it's the pinned tweet at the moment. 
uh, we're uh, shooting for five thousand uh, dollars, which isn't nearly enough to cover uh, the legal expenses, but it's a good start when you combine that with uh, with dues, uh, and it'll keep us uh, it'll keep keep us solvent until we can actually uh, bargain. Right, our fight that we're having uh, isn't unique. This is stuff that's happening all over the country. Legislative staff is exempt from most labor protections um, in many states. So uh, stay woke. Uh, keep an ear out. Keep an eye out. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Learning and Labor podcast. Like Brady said, I encourage people to contact their legislatures and donate to the union's legal fund. I also want to just give a huge thank you for Brady and the ILSA for coming on the podcast and letting me have the opportunity to highlight this story in such detail. It really does have implications, not just for the state of Illinois, but far beyond that. And I think it is important that more people are aware of this happening. I I personally was sort of aware of the, the surface level details of the situation before this episode, but I learned so much from talking to Brady, and I hope that all of you listening have learned a lot too and can hopefully... Uh, take some lessons from this story into the future. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye. Learning and Labor. Station W-I-L-L has carried a special program this week giving information about the University of Illinois. If you have been a listener to these broadcasts, you have heard more or less about what the university does how it does it, and what it hopes to do. Thank you, Dr. Willard. Anyway, this has been an episode of Learning and Labor.